you look at uh, not too far from here in Philadelphia, you'll see that uh, on the, uh, the, the Liberty Bell, how many of you have seen the Liberty Bell? Uh, it says that it, it, it actually declares that this is the promised land. And uh, for a long time, Christianity wanted to believe that this was the promised land. And then, uh, and then something in this, this, this thing happened. Yeah, actually, we realized that the, uh, the promised land, the, the covenant land, that was the, the promise that was made to, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was actually, it was a real place. It was actually a real, a real land. And uh, so uh, when that happened, we, we, we began, just like uh, many Jewish people began to believe that, the, you know what, the Bible is true, that the Word of God is true. And uh, so this, this has started something with, within the Christian communities. Um, it is a strange thing for us because I'm not a, a, theolo a theologian. I'm not a, a pastor of a, of a congregation or or been to uh, seminary or anything, any, any Christian upbringing or training. My, my, uh, my grandfather was a Baptist, Southern Baptist preacher. And I don't know how many Southern Baptist preachers have actually sp spoke at this uh, synagogue before, but probably, uh, the, or the, the son of Southern Baptist preachers. Uh, but, but maybe this is a first, you know, but, uh, uh, but that's, that was my upbringing. And in Nashville, Tennessee, although we do have a small Jewish community in Nashville, <laughs> I don't know that I ever met a Jewish person growing up. Uh, so this was all, all new. My first trip to Israel was about eight years ago. And when I came to Israel, I ended up uh, on a uh, mountain in, uh, in, in Samaria called the Mount of Blessing. Uh, you've heard the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Cursing, Mount of Gerizim, Mount Ebal. And I ended up on that mountain with a man named Nir. Jewish man born in Israel uh, from Kfar Saba, and uh, and he showed me a vineyard there, and uh, and me being a farmer, it uh, it attracted me, and and I thought, wow, this is this is uh, this is very special, and so as we as I began to talk to him about uh, his his life, and he told me that he would sit in Kfar Saba, which is just right uh, at the at the bottom of the the mountains of Israel, right there, right just on the edge of Samaria. And he would look at his window and just dream of planting vineyards in the mountains of Samaria. And he told me about the prophecies and scriptures about uh, and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Joel, Joel and, and Amos. I'm so sorry if I'm not saying the Hebrew pronunciations are out right, but uh, but he, he was telling me about these these uh, his dreams, and he and he heard the prophets and he read the prophets, and the prophets were saying that uh, you shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. And, and, when, and those, those prophecies are, are is, the, is the word of God, and it actually prophesied to, to the planting of these vineyards in a specific place. When I give tours of Hebron, and, and we begin, I like to start, really to start at the beginning. So I start up in a neighborhood that's called commonly Tel Wumeda. Tel Wumeda, in Arabic, the word Wumeda means ash gray. There was a fire there a few thousand years ago, and the name stuck. But the neighborhood has another name, which is the real name. Okay, tourists come in and they say to me, you know, we go to all of these holy sites in Israel, and it's so interesting, but they're all graves. They're where people are buried. We go to the tomb of this one and the tomb of that one, and even in Hebron, we go to Machpelah, the tombs of Abraham and Sarah. It's very important. But like, where did these people live? And so that's why I like to start in Tel Omeda, because the real name of Tel Omeda is Tel Hebron. And if Machpelah is where, the patriarchs and the matriarchs are buried. This is where they lived almost 4,000 years ago. As we all know, uh, when Gush Katif, uh, located in the Gaza Strip, was destroyed during the disengagement of 2005, and its whole civilian uh, population forcibly transferred, four communities from the northern Shalom were equally and systematically destroyed and cleansed of any Jewish presence. These four communities, Chomish, Sanu, Kadim, and Kanin, along with the rest of Gush Katif, were simply wiped off the map. For us in the Shemron, and for many in Israel, the disengagement, or in Hebrew, we call it the Gerush, which in English is translated to transfer or deportation, is not only the story of destruction and the forced transfer of Jewish communities, and even the story of 8,000 personal tragedies that uh, these brave souls carry with them for the rest of their lives. 
But in retrospect, Gush Katif is a story of a whole nation falsely led by corrupt political leadership down the slippery pole of propagating and believing in a false and deceiving leftist agenda, which we all know is land for peace. When you forfeit Jewish rights, you get no peace. When you forfeit deterrence, you get no peace. When you forfeit sovereignty, you get no peace. What you get is missiles, thousands of them. You get two wars with close to 150 soldiers and civilians killed. You get terror, and you get an American president in cahoots with a corrupt political Palestinian autonomous authority that refuses to recognize Israel as the home of the Jewish nation. They refuse to negotiate. They refuse to forfeit their plan to flood Israel with millions of Arab refugees. So when we meet here today to remember and to fathom the consequences of a political leader who, in wanting to avoid legal action for corruption, executes a plan that results in one of Israel's greatest strategic blunders, we must ask ourselves, what are we really talking about? And what are the implications for today as we hear of the plans to uh, pass a uh, resolution of the UN concerning the establishment of a Palestinian Arab state?